We're going to read our second reading, uh, and that is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. And Brian is going to help us read for us. So thank you, Brian, when you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for reading for us. And um, this morning, it's our privilege to have uh, Peter and Lorraine to share with us uh, from uh, the word, uh, for, for our current series of 5G, as we've been doing. And today, they will be helping us to unpack uh, the, uh, the third G of our 5G is uh, to grow. Uh, and so we look forward to uh, Peter and Lorraine. When you're ready, Peter and Lorraine, yeah. Thank you. I take it that we are unmuted? Yes, we can hear Thank you. you. That's great. Let's just pray as we, as we begin. Gracious Father, as we open your word this morning, we ask that you grant to speaker and hearer alike the presence of your spirit, that hearing we may understand and understanding obey to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. It's an amazing uh, two passages of scripture that we have been given. Um, the first from, well, the first one from the Acts of the Apostles, the second from uh, St. Matthew's Gospel, which is, is well known to many of us. First, I want to comment on the, um, the one from the Acts of the Apostles because something is happening there that I hadn't realized until I was reading the commentaries in, in preparation for this. It, it opens by saying that the disciples were scattered as a result of the persecution after Stephen's death. And as they went, they began to talk and share and just talk in the ordinary way about the faith that they had discovered. And then it says, but some among them, among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who, were, who on coming to Antioch spoke to Hellenists also proclaiming the Lord Jesus. What was happening here is that the gospel was being was now breaking out from just being focused on Jewish people and Samaritans and God-fearers, those who were, who were interested in the Jewish faith and reasonably close to it, now going right outside the Jewish faith directly to Gentiles, directly to people who had no knowledge of what was going on in the Jewish faith. And that, folks, is you and me. We're non-Jews. We're not. We are not Jews. We are Gentiles. And so, what is happening in this passage is that we are being given the opportunity for the first time to hear the good news and to understand it. That's what was happening back then. It's an incredible statement to realize that this was happening. But more importantly, even than that, is that we have no idea who these people were that shared their faith in that way. They're not named. They're not given any titles. They just said they went about and some people came and began to share directly with the Gentiles in, um, in Antioch. So for us too, you may think that your story or your testimony doesn't matter at all. It's just you and how would anyone believe? And the answer to that, folks, or the response to that is to say again, you have no idea the effect that your life and your words will have on the people around you. Be encouraged, as uh, Matthew's gospel lets us know, that Jesus has said, I will be with you right through to the end of this age, right through to when God winds things up in the return of Jesus. So you are promised his presence 
And as you are simply living the gospel, and as you are simply chatting with people, you'll find out that, well, you may not find out, but God is at work in and through you. Your testimony of life and word matters and matters to God, no matter how small it seems to you or whether you happen to have the privilege of talking to a couple of thousand people. So that's number one that I wanted to say. The people that first shared had um, have no names. They are just simply stated in the scriptures. Second is to tell you a story that, that Nikki Gumbel tells if you uh, have ever done the Alpha, Alpha program. But when, it, when talking about sharing your faith, Nikki tells the story of one young man who had got to the point where he wanted to commit his life to Jesus, but he was not able to because he was so terrified of having to share his faith. And he'd been told that that's what Christians did. That was what their responsibility was. Well, the young man was talking with a wise pastor. And the pastor said, look, I'm going to say something to you that's just for you. That command to share the faith, that applies to everyone. But it doesn't apply to you. I want to relieve you of that responsibility. If that was so, would you accept Jesus now? And the young man went away from that discussion into his own room and said, Lord, seeing that I don't have to share my faith, I'd love to, to, to commit myself to you and give my heart to you. And he such so sensed the presence of God that he rushed out of his bedroom. I'm going to say downstairs because it's an English place and bedrooms are usually upstairs in the UK. Rushes downstairs to his family and said, I have met the Lord Jesus. I've come to know him. And the great thing is, I don't have to tell anyone about it. And of course, he's told everyone that's around him. Folks, the kind of faith that is being shared, the kind of thing that we need to be aware of, it's something that just bubbles up within us. It's something that we do and say. We had someone come to our house uh, some months ago with, with members of our family. And as we got to the mealtime, I just naturally said, OK, let's pray. It, that's what we do in our family. That, I didn't say that, but it's just perfectly natural. And so I said, Grace. It wasn't only afterwards that I noticed that one of the family has gone to stay, stand alongside that person because they were concerned that they might be embarrassed. It was just a perfectly natural thing for us to do there. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about as we share our faith in that way. So many are just sort of anxious about how they do it. What we're saying is, please let it just be natural. Let it flow from who you are. Why are so many people frightened of sharing their faith? Well, I can, I'm going to give you three reasons. There could be 103, but there's just three that I want to share with you. First of all, some are unsure whether the message that is contained within Scripture, despite our experience of the living God in our lives, they're unsure as to whether the message can be trusted or is believed. And that goes right throughout our, our um our culture in the West. The Bible has been so undermined over years. I wish I had the time to share with you why that is not so. But what I can tell you with absolute certainty, the best of modern scholarship will show to you that the Bible is a trustworthy book as an historical writing. Our daughter is doing a study in classics at the, author, uh, the university here in Auckland. And one of the things that, that, that happens within the classics department is that the Old Testament is used as a reliable reporter of the historical events that it states. That's in a secular university. We can trust when the Bible speaks, it speaks with a voice that, that can be believed. Secondly, people are unsure of the reaction that they, they will get. If you're anything like me, you're a fairly devout coward. I will run away from anything and everything if I have to, and particularly from people. So if someone is going to say, oh, don't be stupid, then I'm likely to sort of back off. Folks, one of the things I can say from the experience of the church army at the moment 
is that um, our current national director is encouraging people to go door knocking. And when they do, they have been constantly surprised at the openness of the welcome. Or there's occasions when they get a knockback. But most people will listen with politeness as they, as they speak. And now they're told how to speak and what to say and that sort of thing. What we're, we're wanting to underline with this point is to say that people actually are interested in things religious, are interested in spirituality, and we can stand in the market gap place, confident in the truth of the gospel, and share the gospel quite easily and readily, knowing that we will get a positive reaction most of the time. Yeah, it could get difficult. Can't diminish or take away from that, but it is there nonetheless. The third answer, the people, thing that people worry about is, but what if I'm asked questions that I don't know the answer to? Well, I remember being in college two or three centuries ago when I was a young lad. And then um, I said to the lecturer, look, I have got this bunch of sixth formers that I am going to take a religious instruction class with. This was in Australia where that sort of thing happened. I said, what do I do with questions I don't know the answer to? He said, I want you to remember these words, there's three of them. They're really important and then help you with this question. They, these are the words, I don't know. Oh, really? He said, yeah, just say, I don't know. That's a question I haven't answered, I haven't got an answer to. That's a question that I will explore and see if I can bring you an answer. Or it may be a question that you yourself are still struggling with, and that's okay as well. Simply be honest, accept the questioner, accept the question, and be honest about where you're at if you don't know the answer. Now, sure, go and spend some time doing it, and you can go to the fount of all knowledge, who is called Shashi. He knows everything, and you can get yeah. an answer from him. And he will sometimes look at you just as puzzled as the rest of us are, because no one has the answers to everything. Next one is it, it, not, not the next um, uh, thing. They're the three reasons. Unsure of the message, you can rely on what the Bible says. It's, it's trustworthy. Unsure of reaction, a lot of people want to hear what we have to say and will be willing to listen. Yeah, you might get some net, net, uh, knockbacks, but most likely not. And unable to answer questions, just those three little words, I don't know, and find the answer if you can. So how do we share our faith? One of the very clear statements that Peter makes in his first letter, 1 Peter 3.15, if you haven't got that written on your heart, write it down somewhere, make sure you learn it. He says, in your hearts, reverence Jesus as Lord. Now remember I said he's, he is with you. That's not I would say. That's what the lesson said for today. I will be with you. He is Lord. And then always be ready to share your faith, to give a reason for the hope that is in you, is the way that Peter puts it. To give a reason for the, for, for the hope that is in you. And when you do, do it with gentleness and respect. And folks, they are two absolutely key words in the way in which we talk about anything that we know for that matter, but especially when we're sharing our faith. Don't hammer the person with Bible verses or what you know and sort of try to hammer them into, into the ground. Just share gently with them what you know. And above that even, do it with a respect of the person who is there. If they disagree with you, they're allowed to. That's okay. They're allowed their point of view. You respect the person while you still you may disagree with them. You can respect. That's the key to doing it. So that the how of how we share our faith is to do it with gentleness and respect. I want you to hear from Lorraine how she did that. I think, uh, Tenneco Stefano, it's lovely to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting us to share with you in this. I think one of the most powerful images for me in terms of reaching out 
to others is in Acts chapter 13, just a couple of uh, chapters after the ones that we just looked at. And if you'd like to just look with me, if you have your Bibles with you, Acts 13, uh, it's just the first three verses. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who, were brought, who was brought up with Herod the Tetric, and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So that very first picture, the very first step of reaching out to others is, as we see from this text, it was the church leadership. But it doesn't matter that it was the church leadership. That includes individuals as well. And so I'd just like to share with you an example of how that we put that particular verse into practice in our own parish. When I was the vicar of Birkdale Beach Haven on the North Shore for a, a number of years, we had the Alpha course. And uh, I asked Peter if he would come and, and share um, or take the Alpha course with us. Uh, and on the first Sunday that we were looking at this, he asked the whole congregation, before we go any further, he said, I want you to stop and to pray and to ask the Holy Spirit who it is that you should be reaching out towards uh, who it is maybe that you should invite to come to do the Alpha Course. Well, we were sitting in church, and so I did as everyone else, and, and I prayed and asked the Lord who it is that I was meant to reach out to. And a name, a face and a name came into my mind that I thought was absolutely ridiculous. It was, um, we'd only recently moved into this property, and it was a, an elderly man, 80 plus at the end of our drive. And he was the one who came into my mind and I thought, oh, surely I've got that wrong. Um, but it was the one that came and so I prayed for him and we had various conversations. But one particular day on the drive, we had this conversation in which he shared with me, he was a member, I said he was now in, well into his 80s, 86, 87. He said to me when he was 14 years of age, his parents didn't go to the local church. He, they were not churchgoers, but he went along to a Bible class. And there, if he went to the Bible class, after a period of, of weeks, if he was there every week, he, would, he got a little um, picture. And there, at, at the end of the week, if he had all these, these pictures, they would give, the church would give him a Bible. Well, he so wanted a Bible of his own. Um, but unfortunately... Uh, he gathered a number of these tickets, but unfortunately, he, he did a paper round and he was knocked off his bike and he was put into hospital. And so he was in hospital and so he missed out on a couple of Sundays. Well, one day, a vicar, the vicar of that church came in to visit somebody else in the hospital and came along and said hello to him as well. And so he shared his story. He said, I've got all these pictures and I so want to have a Bible. The fact that I've been in, in hospital does that mean I can still get my Bible? And the vicar said, no, you can't have the Bible. Well, he was devastated by that. This man, now in his late 80s, carried the pain of that for, since he was 14. And so I bought him a Bible. And we talked about the Bible. He came to faith. He was our verger in our church until he died. And um, he not only... Um, came to faith, but he shared his faith with others. It was the most natural thing in the world. And I have found in my own experience that whenever I have been a part of sharing my faith with others, it really is God who's doing all the work and you're kind of just in there as a passenger. But it is the most exciting thing to be part of and to see that happening. I just wanted to encourage you today in your faith as you reach out and as you listen to the Holy Spirit as to who it is that he is drawing, that God is drawing to himself. God bless you. As Lorraine has said, this is what's contained within the reading that we had. Just listen to this. There were some from uh, some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came, were coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, that's the Greeks also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. And here's the following verse, the hand of the Lord 
was with them and a great number became believers and, uh, and, and turned to the Lord. The hand of the Lord was with them. I will be with you always, Jesus said. So out of that experience, as Lorraine said, and, and that's happened a number of times over, over the years, as people have been prayed, as we started to pray for people, then there's been the opportunity to witness to them as he has um, directed and prompted. So how we want to finish is with two things. First of all, when we come to prayer, just leave a space of time where you can listen to what the Lord is saying to you. Who is it that he wants you to begin praying for and then letting him produce the opportunities for you to witness to them? And if, if our experience is anything to go by, you will either have a face come across your, your um, mind or else a name will drop into your mind. And like Lorraine and others, you may be surprised at who it is. But as a beginning point, that's the way to say it. Okay, Lord, so now you want me to pray for that person. And what do I pray? Lord, will you create the opportunity for me to speak with that person when they're ready? So you create the opportunity. I'm going to continue to befriend them, live my life in front of them, do all the natural things that I do with them. That's the first thing. The th second thing is, you may be like our daughter who made a commitment to Christ as a preschooler, and she doesn't remember it. We were at a, um, a um, mission, a church army mission uh, down the country a bit, and Lorraine had preached the gospel to the children over, the, a, num over a, a week using a, um, a story. And at the end of it, she said, now, who would like to make Jesus their special friend today? And at that stage, I, I had been talking with another group and walked in, and I could tell you that the sense of God's presence in that place was real. And I said to Lorraine afterwards, hey, somebody made a commitment today, I'm sure. Well, we didn't know, but a few moments later, our little girl comes and tugs mummy's skirt and says, hey, mummy, today I made Jesus my special friend. We didn't know that. That's just what happened. And Beck doesn't remember it herself. But she, and she said to me once, oh, but Dad, I haven't got a testimony. I haven't got a story to tell. I said, Beck, what was the Lord saying to you last week? Oh, well, he said this, this, and this. Okay. What was he saying to you yesterday? Oh, well, he was talking to me about this, this, and this. And I said, there's your story, bub. What is he doing in your life now? Oh, she said, well, I can do that. And that's what I want to offer to you. If you, like me, know when and can take you to the place in Christchurch where I made the commitment to Christ, if you know that, then you can tell that story. If you don't, and you're like the vast majority of people who grew into it while there were certain choices along the way, that's the story that you can tell as well, your story. And here's how you write it down. What was it like before? What happened? And what's it like now? And that may be in three sentences. It may be in a four-hour dissertation. It may be a book. I don't mind. But if you've got those three things in your mind, what was it like before? What has happened? And what's it like now? And write that out, and I can tell you this, write it in such a way that it can be read and was spoken, you can read them quicker than you can speak, that you um, can read it, sorry, write it down so that you can speak it inside of three minutes. Anytime I've done this with congregations, they've usually, when they've started to share their faith, go to about four minutes and a bit more sometimes. That's okay. But if you keep it short like that, you will remember it and not have to have, have uh, read it out. And a number of people have told me after they've done this, how often they have referred to that written testimony without having the notes in front of them. So they're the two things. Will you pray, Lord, who is it that you want me to begin to pray for or continue to pray for? But if it's begin, that's it. And the prayer will be, Lord, 
you create the opportunity for me to say something to them, to them about my faith. That's number one. Number two, will you write out your story? What was it like before? What happened? What's, ha what's it like now? With just those three ideas in mind. In that way, you are saying, first of all, that the one who is the communicator of the faith is God, the Holy Spirit. It's not our work, folks. It's, it's Believe me, none of us can lead anyone to Jesus. The Holy Spirit can and he will use us to help him do that job. We're the junior partners. So pray. Get a name. Continue to pray. Let the Lord do the work. And secondly, write out your story. What was it like before? What happened? And what's it like now? And that can be a story about last week or yesterday or like me 40 or 50 years ago uh, when it happened. That's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> so that's the story. That's the way that we can do it. That part of our discipleship is then placed in the hands of Jesus, but we have made ourselves ready so that we can obey him when he says, hey, now's the time for you to say something. God bless you real good. And thank you for the opportunity to be with you the morning from both of us. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Lorraine, for sharing story and, um, yeah, and opening up uh, the this beautiful account for us this morning. We really appreciate that. And, 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 and as Peter and Lorraine shared with us, let's, uh, as we listen to the next song, which is on prayer, it's a kind of quite a brand new song being uh, released by Rent Collective, the Rescuer song, which we sing the same band. And it's the, it's the prayer which is being kind of released in the context of current world crisis of the COVID and asking, uh, let the Lord, let your bells ring again, let the, your kingdom come, let uh, Jesus be proclaimed. Uh, and, and that is the message of the, the song as a prayer. Uh, and so as we, as we listen to this song, uh, I want to encourage each one of us in a, in a prayer to seek, uh, as we've been encouraged this morning, Lord, who is it? For whom should I pray? For to whom you are leading me to give me that picture, give me that name, give me that location or whatever it might be. Let the Lord reveal to you who that person is or what that situation is where the Lord wants you to be a channel of grace, a channel of his mercy and his gift uh, to, to those people. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go in a time of prayer uh, as we listen to this uh, this song and and ask the Lord who that might be uh, uh, for whom we can pray. Uh, you could pray personally and seek, seek him.